right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I came. To, I got a little bit of an epiphany today. I, I would say. I was thinking about. You know, a lot of people are very have a big hang-up about the name of God. There's like these sacred name movements uh, that insist on that. You know exactly how God's name has to be pronounced and. What, you know, that someone, you're losing out on something if you're referring to God by any other name. And all of this, you know, focus on the semantics of the name of God. And I realized, you know, that is exactly why in the Jewish tradition God's name is ineffable. Because you're not supposed to be hung up on that. You know, that's pretty much what I what I realized. You know, all these people who are obsessed about, oh, you know, exactly. I was reading from one of these sacred names movements, some literature online, and it just it's just so ridiculous. Does it really matter how we refer to God? That we don't understand God. We can never understand God. All of the angels never don't come to any slightest fraction of the understanding of God because God is infinite and so there is no fractionality in that which is infinite. And so to be hung up on exactly how to pronounce God's name and, and things like that that we see in, in certain in certain sects, it's just it's silly, and it's not really central uh, to anything that's really important, in, in my view. And I believe that's why, you know, the reason why God's name is ineffable in our tradition is because we are told not to take God's name in vain. And by being of obsessed with, with the name of God, exactly how it's to be pronounced and so forth, we're missing the mark. We're missing, we're missing the whole point. Because as much truth as we have, we can never really understand God. And God has blessed us with, some, with, with a Torah of truth. In His abundant love and grace, He gave us His Torah. But the Torah is a gift for us so we can live a lifestyle that's necessary. I, I came in yesterday to shul a little late because I had to wait for my wife to get home so I had to be home with the kids. And the Rav Shlita was, you see the end of his uh, drasha on the, my last video. And the part that I had missed that I was there for and there was more that I had missed and I didn't get to talk to him about he was discussing how essentially, for a human being to try to be an angel, that will destroy the world. He, this, you know, he, and, uh, I didn't record this story, but the story is told many times. You know, a few different stories, similar stories that he has about, you know, over religious. men on their wedding day. You know, one is a joke, you know, a boy at Talmud Chacham, who, um, you know, he was so involved with learning, he, he didn't think of anything else. And they found him a shidduch, and, they, and, 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 you know, he was getting older, and, he, and the wedding day came, and he was nowhere to be found, and his father went to this medrash and found him there. And uh, he said, I'm in the middle of a, a very difficult Rambam. 
and, uh, and he said, yeah, but you, what are you doing? You have to go get married today. So then he goes, he's about to leave without the kala, without the bride, and the, um, And, and they said, well, where are you going? He said, well, uh, you're supposed to go home with your, with your, you know, your wife. He said, what, me? Go, go alone with, with a woman? I've never done anything like that in my life. And anyway, uh, I told you I was in the middle of a difficult round bomb, you know. You have, I have to get back to this medrash. He said, you know, Yasala, to go back to the round bomb is a mitzvah, and, and to go home with your wife, is, uh, with your bride, it's also a mitzvah. So then he said, well, if it's a mitzvah, then you go do it. You know, that, that's the joke Rabbi Fishbane always tells. And another story, that it was a true story, of how there was a chassan under the chuppah who was saying to the Messiah Kedushan, you know, by us, by the chassidim, we have very thick veils that you can't see who's under. By the uh, more modern, probably more true to the halacha, is a, a sheer veil. So, and, and in this case, mo- most likely, the, the more modern opinion is correct. Uh, although there are various reasons. One way or the other. So, so all of this being said... The Kala had a very thick veil. The bride had a very thick veil, an opaque veil, and, and the groom said to the, to the officiating rabbi, to the Messiah Kedushan, uh, you know, it's, it's a question halacha. And, and the uh, Messiah Kedushan said, you know, you got if you thief, what's wrong with you? At a precious time like this, this is what's on your mind? You're supposed to be so involved with emotion and you lost out on that because you, you became too intellectual. And sometimes we become too emotional and we forget the intellect. We have to find a proper balance. And an angel could be pure intellect or could be pure emotion. There are different types of angels that are like that. And if a human being is an angel, he destroys the world. That's what Rabbi Fishbane says. It makes me think of, you know, it, the uh, the seraphim. The, I guess in English they say seraphim. The seraph, which actually, if you look into the biblical text and do word study, you'll come to the conclusion that the form of the seraphim would be something like a dragon with six wings. Bible says they have six wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, and two to fly. Why do they need to cover their face and their feet? So, so the, the Zohar says, because uh, I'll say, that they shouldn't look what's above and they shouldn't look what's below. The Mukubalim explained that they would be destroyed if they looked what's above them or what's below them. They have to stay on their level. Human beings, on the other hand, can transcend their levels. We, we can interact with levels that are different than our own. And so we are able to look above and below a little bit. But if we get too much involved in these things, we can also get burnt up. We can also get destroyed. It, it could destroy the whole world. And this is what one of my colleagues always he said to me once. He said that we have to ask God forgiveness for being too religious. And indeed it's true. On the other hand, if we're not religious at all, and I don't mean, you know, we can have people who are priests, who are rabbis, who are just not really religious, you know. I, 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 there's a, a guy on YouTube, reporter, a 
Babacher guy who married a Japanese girl. I don't know if she was Megaya or not. It's none of my business. Uh, if she was, she wasn't. If, 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 you know, if, if she wants to be and she wasn't, I, I would help them out. I'd be happy to help them. Um, but he, you know, he was talking about how the Shinto priests in Japan, you know, they take a lot of money. Often, you know, our religious life could just be a business. I saw, I saw today uh, a picture of a protester in Israel. He said, uh, he said that kashrut zelo esek that 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 kosher it should not be a business. It should, it's a religious devotion. Now, of course, uh, you know, things cost money. Time is money, but it has to be fair, you know. I remember someone, he said to me, you know, his preacher in, in his church is a plumber, and so therefore he doesn't have to charge money to be the pastor of the church. He doesn't have to take a salary from the church. He, he has a, a successful business. Of course, what I've heard, I, uh, oh, the paraduma. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that he charges a lot for his plumbing business, this particular uh, man, maybe more than his uh, hair, as some people have claimed, uh, some clergy people have claimed like that, but I know. Um, but that being said, I myself, I, I was a, a part-time rabbi in a shul that paid me a very meager salary, something like $800 a month, to be a, a, a still very part-time, but most most schools like that, they would pay eight, at, more than that for, for a weekend, you know, and they, and they were paying 300 for a weekend. You know, I'm looking now at the synagogue, looking to hire a rabbi, and, and they're saying, you know, for they pay eleven hundred dollars just for a weekend. So they only take the rabbi two weekends a month, but that's, you know, that's a decent amount of money. Um, but then I know other, you know, I know certain rabbis who are making, you know, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. I think that's excessive. But again, it depends where you're living. You know, uh, one my colleague, my same colleague, he was talking about the early uh, missionaries that the Tsar of Russia sent to America to plant Russian Orthodox churches in America. And he said those, those guys, they, they got paid very, very well because the Tsar was paying their salary. Um, so, again, whatever it is, there's different... And, and the thing is, yeah, if you're going to... You know, it depends how valuable something is. I do believe that clergy deserve to make a living wage. You know, um, I don't. I, I don't think it's fair to expect necessarily to expect a clergy person to have an extra job. It depends where you're living and everything. You know, uh, my uh, my current position, which is very good for me, um, is this. A full-time position and uh, a similar position in a different state um, pays the same amount for half the time um, under certain circumstances. And so everything, you know, has to be taken in stride. That's what life is about. Finding the balance between the intellectual and the emotional, between the material and the spiritual. We are here, part of the way that our society exists is we need to make a living. You know, whether we're subsistence, living off the land, or living in a society that makes life, I believe, much better than, than just a subsistence lifestyle. 
everyone has their own their own way of life and uh, I can't say which one's better which one's worse but the fact of the matter is financial success allows one to be devoted to things of the spirit if one so chooses but then our sages say Marba Nechosim Marba Daiga you know I know someone recently came into a, a moderately large inheritance and they don't know what to do with themselves they, they never had so much money in their life and they don't know how to live with, with this money they don't know what to do with it and the thing is is you know if I was in their situation I would make investments in real estate and things and try to have a little bit you know have my money make money for me I'm not in that position right now in my life to do things like that I don't know if I ever will be um, but if, if I was in that situation that's what I would do but I don't think they have that understanding in life how to how to live like that but it is what it is and so we you know we have to figure out how to live a life a gift from God. I don't think there could be anything else that could be said than that. The glory of living in a society that functions well, in a functional society, and it's something that God gave us a gift through faith, through religion, through revelation. He gave these things to us. Pretty good translation of Torah, but it's also not a perfect translation. 
like Rabbi Siegel says, there's a French saying, I only heard it from him, that a translator is a traitor, and that's why the French are very insistent on speaking their own language, and so too are the Arabs, very insistent on their language. I think, though, that we can translate things into other languages, and while they, something is always lost in translation, still things can be gained as well. did it, then you, you stop being curious. Now, I don't believe that was ever a problem among us Jews, and 
Professor Tyson points that out. You know, he, he shows how how few the Jews are. Um, the world, and yet how many Nobel Prizes Jews have won, including religious Jews. You know, Robert Wallman, who incidentally uh, said that the Samba Rebbe was right, just point that out, he, well he said maybe the Samba Rebbe was right, um, which is good. You know, we can also say maybe Rav Cook is right. We don't have to be. We can, we should not become fundamentalists. You know, like Rabbi Siegel tells a story about. Um, you know, he was uh, trying to paskin a Mara, and he went to a, a Hungarian dying, uh, and uh, someone from you know Satmar gestimmt, and. He said that um, he said that. and asked, who are you to Poskin on these things? And he said, we had Shibush by. And he said, oh, okay. And then he, he said, you know, Rabbi Siegel, the Talmud Mufak, Zechem Avadia, Zechem Tzak, the Prophet. And so then he said that something from Chacham Avadia. And then he's like, oh, now I'm going to get the, a, 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 a frask and ponim, you know. Here I, I mentioned a Zionist rabbi, someone, a chief rabbi of Israel, from an anti-Zionist Dayan. And and the Dayan said, no, I, 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 I had that in mind as well, I know that. And he was like, oh. Meaning, this guy isn't a zealot. He was like, how dare you mention one of the accursed Zionists? Oh, that's silly. You know, that's not that's not Yiddishkeit. I'm sorry, with all due respect. The same thing, you know. I, I, I that's one of the things I could not accept from the Troy Carta. And and I was very highly offended by the Troy Carta. Talk about certain Gadol Israel, and, and, they, and they wouldn't hesitate to Rachman Latzlon Afro Lefume to say a word like Zuck and Mamre. And even if he has a good point, and he and Taka had a good point in, in his argument, but you can't say Zuck and Mamre. You know, I, I once saw. A, I've seen several of the chief rabbis of Israel. I always show them respect. Even if I disagree, you know, it's interesting, you know, how here I was, this article that I was mentioning where I saw, you know, that Akash was not a business. It was talking about that the, the rabbinut should be
I, I you know, I never met him. I've met Avi Weiss a few times. He's a wonderful person. Rabbi Avi Weiss, a wonderful person. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. I have respect for him. I don't have to agree with everything he believes. Same thing. And, and a lot of the things he's quote unquote liberal on, I, I actually agree with him. I more uh, disagree over Zionism than over women's ordination issues, although I've made it clear that I don't believe women should be ordained the same way men should be ordained. I believe, you know, kind of similarly, there's a discussion in the Catholic Church of, of ordaining women as, as deaconesses, and, and finding, you know, and similarly, you know, we make the distinction between a, a rabbi and a rabbinson and a rabbi and a cantor and a rabbi and a and uh, any other number of things and a cantor could still do a wedding could still do a uh, a um, a funeral probably not necessarily uh, the best situation because in general we honor the rabbi of the town to be a Messiah Kedush, and that's a Jewish tradition. You know, you see today in many of the Haredi circles that uh, they honor Rosh Hashiva to be Messiah Kedush. Uh, a good Rosh Hashiva should also be a Rav somewhere. Should have, should have a Kehillah, my Rosh Hashiva. Uh, two of my Rosh Hashiva were also Rabbonim. My branch because should have Rufu Shlema. He was a rub in the shul, several different shuls, and uh, and so too uh, Rabbi uh, Lazarus, the dying. You know, so it's important that that uh, that that, that Rosh Yeshiva also rub on him. And also my Shiva Rabbi Freilich, he was also once a Rav of a shul. There's a Cheshivas in that, 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 that a, uh, that a Rosh Shiva should be a Rav, or at least have experience of being a Rav. Um, you know, I don't know what else to say. of the 
case. It was about a court case. You know, that's what the... It was a court drama, this movie. Almost uh, along the lines, something like the a reverse of the, um, of the Scopes Monkey trial. That instead of Scopes, uh, the secular, were being put on on the trial for opposing religion, it was the religious who, and in this case it was a history teacher, who was totally within context, and I don't see anything wrong with it, as a Jew, as a, someone who's not a Christian. Um, one of the students asked something about, you know, uh, comparing, you know, they were learning about Gandhi and, and King and comparing to certain teachings from the, from the Christian Bible. And, and in a proper historical context, this student uh, asked a question and the, and the teacher answered the question and then turned into a whole court case. It's a little bit, I think, a little bit over the top. I don't think it really ever gets that bad, but maybe it does. I don't know. It was an interesting, interesting, you know, discussion in the film. But I agree, as someone who's not a Christian, that Christianity has had a major impact on history. And, and all the history books that I've ever seen, from, you know, social studies taught in school discuss religions because that's part of history religion is part of history it's part of social studies and I taught in yeshiva I taught basics of various religions in a social studies setting From the rising of the sun to setting thereof, great is my name among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Which means that um, all God's name is ineffable. Worship is ultimately accepted by God and directed really to God. They call him the God of Gods. This is another issue that I think we need to address within Judaism. It's the question of universality versus tribalism. And 
again, these are two issues that do not have to be necessarily in total conflict with one another. You know, I heard something about how Barack Obama, after, you know, he's, he's a candid conversation he had with someone, and he's saying something about how, oh, I guess the people, they want to go back and, and be with their own tribes. And the thing is, is I, I don't see that being the teachings of Donald Trump. I don't see Donald Trump advocating tribalism. I see Donald Trump as a universalist who believes in individual freedoms and recognizes uh, the value of different cultures other than his own. Donald Trump has a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for Jews and Judaism. More for Judaism than for Jews, which I share that with him. Although he might have more respect for Jews than I have, to be totally honest. But the question is, of tribalism versus universality, can we have both? You know, I, I you know, it, coming in contact with different religions, being a chaplain, serving all faiths. <clears throat> you know, obviously, Christians and Muslims believe their worldview to be universal. Um, I, I am in contact with the Native Americans, you know, that, that's one of the groups I minister to. And they teach Native American spirituality. To, and some of the people claim Native ancestry and some of them don't. But this being said, they, um, interesting thing that they teach is that since they are on the land of the Lenape tribe, they are bound to follow the Lenape traditions, whether or not their ancestry is Lenape. And uh, these are the questions within Judaism, you know. Do we, um, you know, there's the idea of minagamakum. You know, if you're in a Sephardic community and you have an Ashkenazic ancestry, what are you supposed to do? And really, if you would follow what Chazal say. Uh, an Ashkenazi Jew among Sephardim should follow the Sephardic traditions, and the Sephardic Jew among the Ashkenazim should follow Ashkenazic traditions. Um, for sure, where they are stricter, but the Ashkenazi among the Ashkenazim should follow just the regular Ashkenazic traditions, and the Sephardi among the Sephardim should just follow the Sephardic traditions, but but the, uh, the one who's visiting should follow the, the stringencies of both, according to Chazal. That's how I would understand, you know, the Mishnah, Mishnah in Sachem about that, Mishnah in Yuma. But do we take that so far as to say that there are local gods, which is, you know, the mistake of the Kuthians, the Samaritans? And uh, we, of course, disagree with, with that idea. We believe there's only one God. Um, but the people call him by different names, and it's really all the same. And the answer is, we were given a certain truth. That is a great truth. Probably the greatest truth that any human beings have been given. But just because my wife is beautiful doesn't mean your wife is ugly. Just because we have the greatest truth doesn't mean that you have falsehood. You know, certainly uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, he was faithful in his own religion, and but he still said that every religion has a piece of the pie, you know. It's just that he believes his had the whole 360 degrees. Um, and I believe that to be true of mine, that mine has 360 and maybe his has, you know, 180 or something. 
And obviously, most of what he has comes from us, but that's especially the stuff that's true. But that's neither here nor there. But we, the Rambam saw reason to respect Aristotle, who was a pagan. We we do live in a multicultural society, even if we have our own beliefs, and so and that's part of the ineffable nature of God. And so we have to be true to ourselves and be faithful to our own traditions without being disrespectful of others. It's a very difficult balancing act, and that's what life's all about, and that's why we don't mention God's name. That's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. I thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe.